Uh, today's rough plan is the following. So let me actually, before today, let me uh, recap yesterday. So. What did we do yesterday? So we set up the problem, and we said the problem was uh, G is fixed, and rho is a representation of GL. And then we said we want to write a trace formula, which would do the following pi um, of Ramanujan type and then there's the multiplicity of pi and we're also fixing a finite set finite set of places and all I, I'm only talking about Q but everything can be generalized of course so we would like to get a formula that looks like the following here, f is just a function, compactly supported smooth function on the, <clears throat> the points in S, and m pi rho was the order of the pole, uh, well, order of the pole, of L S pi rho. So the partial L function, but they, have, they should be having the same order anyways. And anyway, so we wanted a formula like this, then we said that uh, these quantities can be expressed as certain limits. Uh, so in this case, limit over P. Of A pi rho P's. Where these are the coefficients of the L function right here. And the sum over these, we said, sum over pi a pi rho uh, p's can be expressed as the trace of a certain operator. In the tampered spectrum, we said p comma rho. And then we would like to use the trace formula to actually get a geometric expression for this and to evaluate the limit. So this is what, we, uh, what the problem was. And we then tweaked the problem a little bit and said instead of looking at the uh, order of the pole, one could also look, capture even more information if one looked at the residue uh, of ls pi rho at s equals 1. So instead of this, one puts basically the residue here. Uh, yes, it is simple. I mean, honestly, if you don't take the limit here and just look at the asymptotic expansion, you don't really need to assume it's simple because the asymptotic expansion would give you the order of the pole as well, because if the pole is not simple, say it's of order m, then the asymptotic expansion would look like x times log x to m minus 1. So you would actually get this m right here. But it will be more complicated, of course, because there are these logarithmic terms usually are not that easy to isolate, although like if everything boils down to a contour shift, they're exactly the same way. It just follows from some Cauchy integral formula. <clears throat> so if, if higher order poles, then one should basically look at the asymptotic expansion of the sum rather than taking the limit immediately. Um, and then we said, okay, uh, so yesterday again, we said the absolutely first, the simplest example, we said, let's look at GL2 and Eichler-Selberg trace formula which basically gives the trace of the Heike operator on the space of cosmetal automorphic forms of uh, weight k. I'm writing SL2z because this is customary. I, the formula is for GL2. Um, cosmetal automorphic, co cosmetal holomorphic forms of weight k of full level. And there, the, basically the formula said the trace of uh, our cusp in that case of f where f is a very specific test function, I'm just going to put an n here to, de 
distinguish that we're looking at the amp Hecke operator. This was a sum of three terms. So let me just write it as, as follows. So, which I called AN plus BN plus CN. Not sure why I put the parentheses around these things, but anyways. And this was the contribution of the uh, trivial conjugacy class, the identity. This was the contribution of, uh, I believe, hyperbolic and unipotent. And this was the elliptic conjugacy class. So what we did was we first evaluated the uh, average over ANs. And this did not contribute. And then we said, we saw that somehow the hyperbolic conjugacy classes contribute to the sum over integers, but not over the primes. But anyway, so contributed, contributed I forgot, 1 over 1 minus k, I guess. I'm not sure. k was the uh, weight. I forgot what exact contribution was, but one of them. And then this was the, uh, the hard task. And to evaluate the elliptic part, or to, to understand the elliptic part, the elliptic part, we did three things. Well, sorry, five things, <laughs> not three. Uh, we broke the whole thing into steps. So we said the first step was, eichler salberg trace formula came as a certain, in a certain form. We rewrote this and got an expansion. So rewrote the uh, elliptic part. And we got this expression as follows. So where this L function was basically, I mean, it is a weighted sum of Dirichlet L functions, and it, encaps, it captures both the volumes of centralizers and the orbital integrals in itself. And this, you should think about the regularized orbital integral at infinity. A better way of doing this would be actually to put the infinity factor in here as well, but like that, that we didn't do that, we could have. So step two was uh, we introduced, so our idea was to basically do a Poisson summation on M, but for that we needed to somehow handle this L function. We had a technical tool for that. Uh, that's the approximate functional equation. That gave an expression for L1 as a sum over so there's a sum over L and F. And then we had a certain cutoff function that uh, looked like the looked like following. There was a dual sum, which involved an H. In any case, this was uh, step number two. And then step number three was we applied the Poisson summation on the variable M. I'll tell you in a second what this actually means. Step four was We uh, analyzed the dominant contribution. For each n, and we summed, actually, over m. So this gave, so symbolically, this gave a sum over m is equal to sum over c. Okay. So this c equals 0 of n basically means we're doing this for each n fixed up till step three, and then step four, we brought the n in. So n was the nth Hecke operator. Once again, we're looking at the trace of the nth Hecke operator when we're averaging them all out in n. And it is only in step four that n came in. Until step four, everything was for each n. And step five was the uh, 
the hardest step actually that we did not really talk too much about, but we analyzed the sum over n of the c not equal to zero terms. Yeah, maybe it's a better idea to write this way. Okay, so this was the five steps that we actually went over in the very specific case of the eichler selberg trace formula. So today's plan is basically to generalize this to the following setting. So today, we'll talk about, well, generalization of this, generalize this to, um, an arbitrary test function f. Uh, I'm going to call this f infinity because I'm not going to allow any ramification still, and I'll tell you in a second why I won't be allowing any ramification. Uh, so this is g of r. So we are basically going to stick with, so still g will be gl2 over q. So we're not going to leave GL2 until the, third, the second lecture of today, I think. So we'll generalize these steps to GL2 for an arbitrary test function. And here we're going to see a couple of uh, differences. So we will talk about the discrete part of the trace formula of the trace formula and how this actually has extra distributions than just like things get very complicated. Th things get fairly complicated as soon as you leave the eichler selberg realm. Uh, we will talk about this. Then we'll talk about isolation of special terms. So discrete part and isolating. Um, well, let me just say non-tampered contributions. But it's not just non-tampered, it's actually uh, basically everything that is not of Ramanujan type we will isolate. So there will be some tampered contributions as well. And then we will compare, so, and this will presumably pretty much end my discussion of uh, like this setup. Then I would like to compare this setup to what is being, like what has been done in the paper by Frank L. Langlands and Nigo, because they also took the same problem, at least like this discrete part of the trace formula problem, where they isolate the most non-tempered contribution, but they don't isolate anything else. So I'd like to compare this approach to that approach and see where things actually change and what is different in their approach. And then I will take a detour to, uh, well, I'll, okay. Uh, I'll also talk a little bit about the singularities and transfer. Uh, paper of Langlands, because there he actually does a couple of calculations regarding to certain objects that go in here. And finally, at the end, I'll hopefully say something like a little bit about like where one may be looking at in the future. I'll talk about Arthur's conjectures and conjectural stratification. And maybe I'll mention the approach of Jacques Zagier to the trace formula and maybe it can be used at the very least in lower rank cases. Okay, so this is the rough plan and I think somewhere in between here and here, we will also have Tasha. So that's that's where you roughly <laughs> fit in. Um, <laughs> okay. So, all right. This is the rough strategy. So let me keep the strategy here. Step one, step two, step three, and erase a little bit to uh, get a little bit of space. Okay, so the problem, as we said, was this. So let's keep everything here and forget about all of the rest of the stuff. And let's start today.
the actual problem right here on the left. OK, so we want this. We want a sum of a certain type of trace formula where each trace is weighed by a residue. But let's start with even before where the sum is actually running over. So the sum is running over those things that are of Ramanujan type. So what does this mean? These are basically pies that satisfy Ramanujan conjecture. And for this, I'm not going to talk about the general Ramanujan conjecture at uh, glance. I'll basically stick to G equals GLN. Actually, let me do, huh? What's that? G is GLN plus one for what I'm going to say. Because Ramanujan conjecture gets complicated for normal groups, so I don't want to deal with that. Um, at least I want to say that these cuspidal automorphic representations are here, basically. Where's that? Oh, we're going to come, come to rho in a second. <laughs> so rho will be, for now, let's keep rho to be arbitrary. Because it's not going to matter too much for uh, what I'm going to say uh, right now. But basically, the strategy is I'm going to describe what happens in the uh, spectral side of the trace formula and the discrete contributions for GLN in general. For that, rho doesn't matter. And then I'm going to pass to GL2, for which rho can be any, anything, because it's easy to write down test functions for uh, arbitrary rho in that case. So the first problem when one encounters, when one wants to actually follow all of these steps for a more general test function than the uh, eichler shimura so we would like to do this for a more general test function. Let's start with that. Test function at infinity. So one word about finite places, like this whole analysis and this L function actually takes care of all the ramification that you can impose. Because whenever you impose ramification, you're going to fix a finite set of places anyways, and everything will happen in that fi fixed finite set of places. That would just modify this L function at finitely many places, so the analytic properties of the L function is not going to change. So from an analytic perspective, the analysis of all this will basically stay the same. The only thing that will change is if once you introduce ramification, of course, these limits will no longer be zero anymore. So there will be contributions. Like, for instance, we saw in the first lecture that if one takes the symmetric square L function for GL2, there'll be contributions from dihedral representations, which one would see by introducing ramifications. Because if you don't introduce ramification, dihedral representations don't appear. They, they always are ramified, so to speak. Um, <clears throat> okay, but those are uh, remarks uh, for the end. So let's start with the beginning. For the eichler selberg trace formula, we didn't even care about this because the formula was given to us as a sum over Ramanujan terms. In particular, for GL2, for in that scenario, the Ramanujan type just means for holomorphic hospital, what guys are all Ramanujan type. They satisfy the Ramanujan hypothesis, so we had a formula. For general test functions, however, so even problem number zero, let's say, the trace formula this is the Arthur Selberg trace formula. So it basically is an identity between the following of the following types. So it gives a distribution on the left, which one should think about, think of as the trace of an operator on the cuspidal side of the on the discrete spectrum, but it's a little bit more than that. And this is roughly, um, the, I'll just say elliptic, regu regular. But this is not true, of course. Well, let me just also say hyperbolic. So what I want to say is basically there's a discrete part of the spectra which is equal to, so to speak, like at least uh, just, just as a first order approximation as a geometric part and the terms are like elliptic and hyperbolic. So in about 45 minutes we're going to see what supplementary terms actually come in both pictures but they're secondary for what I'm going to say. 
The problem that we face at the beginning is this is, this has, so to speak, the sum over pi of Ramanujan type in it, like of uh, trace of pi of s, but it also has extra terms, has more terms. So let me actually go over this very quickly to what type of terms we are, we're going to be looking at. So here is a very quick recap of what contributes to the discrete part of this trace formula for GLN. Um, so for this, I mean, there are various ways of approaching this, but I think the most hands-on approach is the following construction. This goes back to Maglen and wells -Berger. Uh, so, a digression. Let's uh, make this a little bit more colorful. Discrete part of the trace formula. For GLN. So, it's a little bit misleading, but one, what one should be thinking about is the following. The trace formula is a distributional identity. And the discrete part basically means for a given f, test function f, there will be a contribution from certain representations that are discretely occurring on the left. And these are, of course, the representations that occur discretely in L2 will contribute discretely, but there will be extra contributions to this distribution that are coming from the continuous spectrum. So this is where we will actually get a little bit of trouble, but uh, let me start talking about, so there will be three types of contributions. So let me just write this thing down as follows. So in general, so I of, I discrete of F will look like, will have, will be a sum of the following type. So it'll be a sum over pi's. There will be a coefficient uh, a of pi, let's say. And then there will be a distribution f of pi. And three types of pi's will contribute. So, okay, let's do following. And there will be contributions, so three different types of representations pi will contribute. And the first part is the following. So this will be, these will all depend on certain partitions of, or factorizations of n. So we're gonna basically write if n plus one, by the way, you may be wondering why I'm writing n plus one. There is a reason for this because like a lot of things actually come as symmetric powers and n plus one is a better uh, indexing for that, but at the moment it's not going to be great because you're going to see I'm going to write down this factorization as m plus 1 plus d plus 1. So this is a factorization of two numbers. So take, for instance, like m equals 4. This could be 2, 2, 1, 4, or 4, 1. <clears throat> so basically what we're looking at is the following. So look at blocks of size m plus 1. And there are d plus 1 blocks. And for each one of these blocks, I'm going to put a unitary cuspidal automorphic representation mu uh, of GLM plus 1. And then I'm going to twist this guy with uh, determinant 2 d over 2, then all the way up to determinant 2 minus d by 2. So and I will induce this, so to speak, all the way up to, uh, well, let's, let's call this sigma d of mu. d referring to the twist up here, mu is the mu. Well, this will be reducible, but it will have a quotient, a unique quotient, and that guy will actually contribute to this i discrete. Um, 
In terms of Arthur parameters, maybe uh, it's a better idea. So this guy will have an S uh, a, a Langlands parameter, and this will be the symmetric dth power of SL2, basically. So that will be it. And these guys will contribute. I discrete. And moreover, if D is not zero, then these are non-tampered. So in other words, they don't, I mean, they're not Ramanujan type, so they don't satisfy the Ramanujan hypothesis. So as soon as your n plus one, the group that you're looking at has a, a factorization where this D is non-trivial, then you're gonna get a non-tampered contribution. So this is number one. Uh, number two is a uh, cousin of this. Again, n plus one is m plus one times d plus one. This time you induce the same thing, but um, without the twist. So you look at mu, 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 and induce. So these guys, so let's call this sigma mu. So these guys will actually contribute, so they will contribute. Uh, these are tampered, but they still contribute to the discrete side of the trace formula, the discrete part of the trace formula. Maybe I should also tell you what these a pi's are. So here a pi's is a pi's one for these. These actually do appear discretely in the L2 spectrum. That's the thing. These are the non-tampered parts of the L2 spectrum. On the other hand, these guys are not parts of the L2 spectrum. Uh, well, they're continuous. They're parts of the spectrum, but they're continuous, but they still give a discrete contribution to this distribution. And a pi here uh, is going to be minus one to the power, I believe, n minus m over n minus m, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yes. So this will be important. And the third one, Third one here, of course, D is not zero here. Because if D is zero, N is equal to M, and you don't get, I mean, this doesn't make much sense. And if D is zero, you're looking at a hospital or a representation of the whole group, so that's, yeah, basically, it's not there. And the third part of the contribution is, again, N plus one is, M, well, this time, We'll have, it will be a combination of the two, basically. So we will be looking at m plus one times d plus one. This will be this part, and then we will be multiplying this with d plus one. That will be this part. So we will be basically replacing each of these mu's with a representation of this sort. So let me not write down the whole details. But, uh, so these will be also non-tampered. And these are not cospital or L2, uh, discrete or anything, but uh, their, their coefficient, I believe, is minus one to the n minus m prime over n minus m prime. Here, d prime is not zero, or d prime could be zero, actually. This is, uh, d prime zero would be one of these, I think. It would be this, I think. Uh, so let me... So this thing is M prime. I think, yeah, this is, this is the case. And if D prime is zero, then you're back to, uh, uh, maybe this is M actually. If D prime is zero, then you're back to this case where maybe this is the right thing. And if D prime is zero, it's one. Yeah, okay, let's do that. Okay, great. So all I want to say is these are basically induced representations. You either induce, so this is induced from cuspidal, but twisted gives a non-tampered uh, discrete representation. This is induced from cuspidal without a twist, gives uh, basically an Eisenstein contribution. And this is induced from non-cuspidal. So this is, the third part is induced from non-cuspidal. So there are three types of contributions that one needs to check and Maybe I should also say, when d is zero, so the term that we are looking for 
So in that classification on the right hand side, what we are looking for, so, so I discrete of F comes as all these sums over, let's say M plus one is equal to M plus one times D plus one and et cetera plus, well, let me just say type one, type two, type three. So sum over type one plus sum over type two plus sum over type three. And type one actually has the contribution that we're looking for. So type one is sum over pi over monogen type plus the rest. And in terms of that classification, this is just sum over basically n plus one is n plus one. So d is equal to zero plus sum n plus one is m plus one times d plus one, where d is non-zero. So this part is what we are looking for. Not to discourage you, this is just to start the game. So you need a formula on this instead of the whole discrete, spec, uh, the discrete contribution. But when you look at the uh, Arthur's trace formula or anything of that sort, it is naturally a sum, I mean this, this, so it gives a formula in terms of geometric terms for I discrete as opposed to just this term that we're looking for. So number one problem is how do we actually get a formula for that? Okay, so let me just write it as specific problem. So these are step one, step two, step three. Okay, so problem. Trace formula gives an expression. For I discrete as equal to roughly as a first approximation, I will even ignore the hyperbolic terms, I'll just say elliptic regular part. But we want, what we need, so to speak, I discrete minus I, well, minus I discrete but not Ramanujan. For GLN, Ramanujan just means cuspidal. So let's start with that. So we basically want to isolate the Ramanujan term, and the easiest way of doing that is take the discrete part, subtract the non-Ramanujan part, and try to get an expression for this in terms of the elliptic part. In other words, you want basically, since we have an expression for I discrete, We would like to isolate this part in the elliptic part of the trace formula. Okay, so this is problem number one. This is actually a fairly large scale problem because these distributions get quite complicated as soon as you move in higher rank because these, I mean, we're now talking about like these, these guys will actually be full sums over smaller rank GLNs. So there will be a, a lot of contributions. Is that making sense? Any questions so far? So does the problem make sense in the more general, uh, more general setup? Okay. So let's see what we can actually do about this. We actually saw a part of this when we were discussing the GL2 and Selber trace formula, we just basically did not pay much attention because it vanished. So let me uh, make the following remark. Remark. Let's do this. Uh, let's take GL2, take N to be one. 
And let's see what we what we're looking at. So if n is 1, n plus 1 is, well, 2. And there are not that many factorizations of 2. We are either in this case, where we have 2 and 1, or 1 or 2, or we are in this case, when we are 2 and 1 and 1 and 2. So we don't have 2 and 1, because we already are assuming d equals 0. So we have two types of contributions. I will contribute 2 is equal to 1 times 2. And 2i will contribute 2 is equal to 1 times 2. And what will be this? This will be basically the determinant twist, like induction of this. And this will be just the uh, induction of this guy, where it now mu is just a character. So we have actually seen these parameters before at the very first lecture. And we have seen these parameters with mu equals 1. And we saw that these were actually the parameters for the trivial representation. So this guy will give us the trivial representation. And, and I mean, depending on the ramification, there will be more. But uh, let me just also fix to get everything, to set everything simplify, unramified at every finite place and central character uh, trivial on central r plus. So this will imply that this mu is 1. In any case, so these simplifying assumptions will imply that the only contribution in terms of GL2 from type 1 that you're getting, which is not cuspidal, is just a trivial representation. And then for the second guy, there will be one representation that is induced from just like, just the representation 1, 1, and that will actually be uh, what is called, well, this, this will be a discrete contribution from the continuous spectrum. And this is hard to explain, but, well, it is term six in the trace formula of Jacques Langlands, if anybody remembers that. Uh, but I'm sure everybody has a Google, so you can check it out. Um, and Langlands calls it psi zero, like its contribution as trace of psi zero of f in beyond endoscopy. So I'm not going to say much about this for now. I'll write down exactly what this is in a second, but uh, for now, just basically keep in mind that if we're looking at everywhere on ramified case for GL2, there are two terms that contribute to the, G, uh, the discrete side. One is the trivial representation, and one is this mysterious contribution coming from the, uh, the continuous spectrum. And it comes with, by the way, a coefficient, and let's check what that coefficient is. It is minus 1 to the 2 minus 1 minus 0 over 1 minus 0. So this comes with a coefficient minus 1. So a pi is minus 1 for this case. Oh, this, got, this is going to be important. OK. For GL3, you will also get contributions of this form. The first time the contributions of uh, type 3 appear is a GL4, because you need some sort of like extra factorizations up here. All right, great. So now that we have actually set the problem, let's see what we can actually, uh, what we can do about it. So, okay, let's uh, specialize to the case of GL2 and see where these contributions may actually be coming from. Okay, so for now, from now on, the setting that I would like to work on is the following. So it will be almost like the setting of yesterday. It's just that I will allow an extra, a little bit of a flexibility at the uh, factor at infinity. So I'll be talking I'll be taking the following type of test functions. So let's do this. Okay. 
So the setup for the next half an hour will be, I'm going to take G equals GL2 again over Q. Uh, so pi will be unramified at every finite place. So this is pretty much the same setup. So in particular, I'm taking the set that I fixed at in the setup of the problem to be just conti uh, consisting of the infinite place. So this is so far basically exactly the same setup as uh, the Eichler-Selberg trace formula, except that I'm going to allow myself uh, unramified at every finite place. This will, let me just do this. I'll allow myself some flexibility at infinity, so I'll be, I'll take a function that is compactly supported infinity. So for the Eichler-Selberg trace formula, one fixes this function as well. So instead, I'm basically allowing myself some flexibility, and since this is unramified at every finite place, and also like I want the central character, well, so let's do this. So R, R embeds into the center of this group, so I want the automorphic forms to be trivial on this R plus. This is reflected right here, actually, so this is just a remark. And this plus unramified at every finite place plus the fact that we're working over Q implies that these things should have cent trivial central character. So we're, we're looking at basically exactly the same, the same setup that we were talking about, except that we're allowing the infinity to be a little bit more, more general. No, trivial central character. Yeah. Infinitesimal character will certainly be yeah, non-trivial. Um, okay, so those were just technical remarks, but like we're basically, you should be thinking about yourself, what does this do? This does the following in the very uh, concrete effect. Remember, this function was supported in the following set. M was less than uh, 2 root N normally. Now it's actually supported on a bigger set. So you have R elliptic tori contributing to this. In other words, imaginary quadratic extensions coming here as well as real quadratic extensions. That will be the effect. But we'll see how that actually changed things a little bit drastically. So um, I had a lot of notes about how to write down the trace formula, how to choose the test functions, etc. But I will basically skip those and just say the following. OK, one can choose a test function. F, uh, let's, oh, let me also fix a dual group representation. So I'm going to fix rho to be rho of R, which will be symmetric rth power representation of GL2C. Because GL2 does not really have very many representations. This is essentially the only thing that you can pick except for the determinant. So we can choose a test function, f, n. Uh, let me just call this rho. I, I think if rho, maybe we called it f rho comma n, such that uh, the trace of pi f rho of p, I'll, I'll say, will be just uh, Uh, where's the n? So this is n, but I want to just do p because n will actually be a product over divisors of n. And for each divisor, you will actually have another one. So, I mean, we could do n. And this would be just product over n. It will create complications. <laughs> so let me, uh, let me stick to p for now. But you can also choose an n. It will just be more f rho comma p such that, choose a test function, trace of f rho comma p will actually give the trace of the symmetric rth power of this a pi p. a pi p was this attacky parameter. So, I mean, this is 
easy to do in uh, GL2. In general, it's uh, not that easy to do. Basically, what you take is the characteristic function of integral matrices with determinant uh, valuation uh, R. That's what it is. So. No, 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 no. Just, just the peth coefficient I want. Because if you sum these functions, that's the, your basic function. If you sum rho p over, p, well, I mean, I guess rho n over n to the s, this would be the basic function. So if you take trace of pi of this, this would be ls pi. Right? I mean, eventually we will be summing these things over, so it will actually have uh, the same effect. What, why? You, you're unhappy. You can complain. <laughs> So basically, one could choose these functions so that we can get the pth coefficient of the symmetric kth power L function. That's all I'm saying by, by choosing specific test functions. So that the sum trace of pi infinity over f infinity times a pi rho k, uh, rho r, of p times log p is just the uh, log p of trace of r of f infinity times f p rho in the cuspidal spectrum. This is cuspidal. So I hope this makes sense. All I'm saying is you can choose, you can find a test function that actually picks up the pth coefficient of the symmetric arth power representation, uh, L function. Uh, there's, which, which one? The function, I believe, is unique. Yeah, it's, um, it's the unique element of the Hecke algebra. I mean, it's spherical, so yeah, it is unique. I mean, there's because of the Cartan decomposition. There's only one guy. I think. I think so. <laughs> okay. So, once we choose this guy, and if anybody's interested, you can ask me at the end of the uh, class, I can tell you what the actual function is. The problem zero. The elliptic part looks like the following. So the elliptic part takes the following shape. Uh, you're going to laugh because we spent 45 minutes to write the following expression. Uh, well. So basically it is exactly the same thing. I just changed n to p to the r because of the following observation, the pth coefficient of symmetric rth power is p to the rth coefficient of the actual standard representation. So all I'm doing is basically picking n to be p to the r. The difference is in theta infinity. So now theta infinity is no longer just um, supported in the elliptic torus, but it is actually our elliptic torus, but it's also supported in the hyperbolic torus. Um, <coughs> so. I need to tell you what this theta infinity is, so this will actually take a little while. So theta infinity, of course, yes. So theta infinity will be the following. Maybe it's better if I just talk about this rather than writing every detail. So theta infinity will be, so m over 2 p to the r over 2, will be basically the discriminant of gamma with trace m determinant p to the r times the orbital integral of this f infinity with the same element. 
But I'll tell you why this actually, why I wrote it in this form and why I can write it in this form. So first of all, I can write it in this form because I'm taking my f to be invariant over r plus. So I'm free to move around in the, uh, the central direction. So I can actually change the determinant uh, to, basically I can multiply my, my element by p to the r over 2 to p to the r over 2. The function does not change, so the orbital integral does not change. So I can take this p to the r over 2, so the orbital integral only depends on trace over, well, this is just my normalization, but determinant to the 1 half. So this is simply because of my simplifying assumption here. Normally, you would actually have a two-variable function. Moreover, the only terms that contribute to the elliptic part of the trace formula are conjugacy classes with determinant p to the r, or minus p to the r, actually. So I should be setting plus or minus here. And accordingly, this becomes minus or plus. And there will be a plus or minus. But, and this will be basically the sign of the determinant at infinity. But let me just be a little bit, let me lie to you a little bit and basically pretend that this is just plus and this is just m squared minus 4p to the r. If you want to be really pedantic, there's also the contribution that is coming from the conjugacy classes with determinant minus p to the r, which will, basically, which will be easier to treat than this. Okay. So the only difference of this theta to that theta is basically the support. So this guy was supported on the group level on the R elliptic elements, R elliptic tori, supported only on. And this just means that basically m was less than 2 root n in this setting because <clears throat> the tori being R elliptic or R hyperbolic is defined by basically the extension Q square root of M squared minus 4N being imaginary or real in this particular case. Here, this guy is actually supported or can be supported, depend on the choice, on both R hyperbolic and R elliptic. So there are two types of tori, which will con basically, oh, this is L of 1. M squared minus 4p. Uh, hyperbolic tori will, con will be coming from those m, m squared minus 4p to the r that are positive, and elliptic ones will be coming from the negative ones. It's basically if this extension is complex, imaginary, or real. OK. And moreover, one more thing that I actually wanted to say a little bit in a little bit more detail, but um, okay, so this is remark number one. Remark number two is this theta infinity as a function of x again is has singularities. These are these are well understood in the infinity uh, like Archimedean setting. These are singularities of orbital integrals. They're basically of exactly the same shape. So there will be a part of this function will be smooth around the singularity. And then an, another part will actually have this cusp. That, that happened exactly in the uh, eichler salberg trace formula as well. We saw the actual form of the function here. But like in a more abstract setting, this has singularities at minus 1 and 1 which look like basically a sharp cut at minus one. Like maybe this is a better way of actually describing. So it looks like this maybe. Or let me just say this way. I don't know, whichever way you guys actually like because we're going to smooth them out in a, sec in a sec. So it actually looks like something that is supported here that just like cuts down here. This is a, this is a better picture only around the singularities. Otherwise, it just oscillates and does stuff. <laughs> there are. There is the, uh, there's also the smooth part that will be actually different. And the jumps will actually come into picture because of the, uh, the L factor. There's an, 
there's some constants that actually come in. Huh? Yeah. Where's that? Oh, this is the uh, just the real line in this case. Uh, oh, so <laughs> which one? Yes, yeah, so this is only supported in the elliptic torus, which has the singularity, and the rest of the stuff actually is uh, supported in both, both tori. They're, it is supported in both tori. The smooth part is supported in both tori. Okay, so before I finish to the, this lecture, just want to basically set up the problem so we can pick it up in the last one. So we have the exact same type of sum, so uh, set up of the problem, okay, problem, version two. We have this sum, This is again only for GL2 for now. And isolate, we're trying to isolate the contribution of type I and type 2I to this sum. And let me write to you what type I and type 2I actually looks like. Uh, Okay, so what are these I and 2I? I will be the following quantity, 2 times P to the K over 2 times 1, oh, sorry, R over 2, 1 minus P to the minus r plus 1 over 1 minus p to the minus r times, well, this will be a sum over plus and minus in the integral theta plus or minus x. This is the actual contribution. And the contribution type 2 is the following gadget. It is k, uh, r plus 1 over 2 times, again, a sum over plus and minus, which you can avoid x squared minus or plus 1 is greater than 0 of theta infinity or plus minus of x square root of x squared minus plus 1 dx. Okay, so I'm going to stop here in a second. Just the problem is to find these expressions in this guy. And moreover, what you would like is the difference of this minus that should be actually somehow explicit because at the end of the day, this is where we want to start the game. So we're trying to end up in a formula like this, basically, but now we have these all these extra contributions. We want to get rid of them. And in the next lecture, what we will do is we will actually carry out step one, two, and three, and we'll see that the dominant term right here will actually uh, we'll actually have both of these contributions. And then we will take that out and then see what we actually are left with. Okay, so I'll stop here. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. That's uh, that's a great point.
The L function itself is only defined for integer points. It's not even defined on integer points, if you think about it, because like if this thing is a square all of a sudden, it blows up, because this is a zeta now. So you, that, that is one problem, for instance. So there will be problems, so this was kind of like, I mean, you just spoiled the whole premise, but <laughs> there are a lot of problems in applying Poisson summation to this. What was the, uh, oh, so, okay, so you spoiled the promise. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, joke aside, it is true, it is a very good observation. This thing, we want to do Poisson someone, well, P to the R or N in general here, but uh, this is only defined for integral elements. What did we do last time? Like yesterday's thing was also the same, right? Because this is only defined for integral elements. What we did was we switched, so we broke our sum to congruence classes, and each congruence class we did plus on sum. Then we basically got rid of this, we took this out. So it is almost like switching, well it's not, it's exactly switching summation. So you're breaking your function into congruence classes somehow where your almost like volumes and orbital integrals are constant somehow. It's, uh, maybe that's a good way of thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, there is. So, there, oh, you mean, uh, okay, so philosophical reason or? Okay, philosophical reason is the following, or at least for me. Well, what is the main contribution to this guy? L look at the, uh, just, no, no, forget about that. Look at the, uh, just, The spectral part. The main contribution to the spectral part is a trivia representation, or like the most non-tampered term, so to speak. On the right-hand side, the major contribution, the big chunk, is the elliptic part. So basically, this guy, wherever the, this non-tampered term, it should appear basically somewhere around the elliptic part, because that is the big contribution. Okay, so look, you're looking at a sum of this sort. And the trivia representation, like with all this jazz aside is off size p to the r over 2. Like as a function of p or as a function of the nth Hecke operator, it's of size n to the r over 2. So how would you get n to the r over 2? It's basically the integral of this function. And the L function is on average 1, by the way. So you can basically think about this, if I was a physicist, I would just replace this by 1. So you, would, you essentially are looking at a sum over here where you can do Poisson summation. A better, a better reason probably is the following. If you actually look at this over the steinberg hitchin pace and Langland's thetas and all of them, so what he shows in the singularities and transfer paper is somehow these theta function, although the, uh, singularity, uh, the orbital integrals have singularities, they have jumps, and they're jump, like complicated jump conditions and everything, but somehow he shows that if you put the orbital integral with the tor torus volume of, local volume of the torus, local L function, times the discriminant, those jump conditions somehow smooth themselves out to a function that is Poisson summable. And this is like almost like magic, because like these things are very, I mean, like complicated singularities. They actually do add up overall tori to give you a function of decay enough so that, that it would actually be Poisson summable. Okay, approximate functional equation is a very uh, unfortunate misnomer, by the way. So it, I'm not actually looking for, so are you thinking about just the elliptic torus business, or which part? No? I mean, here is the thing, so, like, look, look at this. So you have a f, f of n times, there's a character for n. Right? So this guy is only defined for n just integers. But you can write this, yeah, right? I mean, this, this is one or minus one, depending on n is like. So you could write this as like, right? You don't even write the Fourier series. You just like say a mod four, and then you just basically look at these guys. Or a better way of saying this is just break this whole sum into, well, n is equal to 1 and n is equal to minus 1. 
or I mean, four is a bad four is a bad one anyways, but it doesn't matter. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's just like at the end of the day, you're left with a sum, a function that is defined over all the integers. I mean, it is a very standard thing to do. You're very unhappy. <laughs> Anyways, we can discuss it a little bit. Yes, so these are spectral contributions. So these are actually just by while integration formula. So these are spectral contributions. And we want to understand them in the geometric side. So this is the geometric. Yeah, I wrote this pretty explicitly, but basically what this is is, I mean, this is the trace of the following matrix, P to the R over 2, P to the minus R over 2, which is the symmetric rth power of the trivial. And this guy is a little bit, this requires a little bit more effort because it, uh, it's a little annoying. 